Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to We Dive Deeper, episode nine. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much to anyone who has rated the podcast, who's commented on Instagram, or let me know that you're enjoying the episodes and that you like what I do, because it means so much and I'm so grateful because I love, love, love doing this. So just thank you so much. My guest today is me. Uh, which sounds strange. I realise I've been on every single podcast you've listened to of this. But me and Dan thought it would be kind of a cool idea to have me answer some of the questions. I had no idea what was coming, obviously, and I didn't realise that I'd speak about some of the things that I speak about in this podcast. But that is the beauty of these questions. You never know where the conversation is going to go or what bits of your past it's going to pick up. So I hope you enjoy our chat. Dan, thank you for asking me the questions and taking uh, the host role of the podcast for a little bit. Um, And yeah, I really hope you guys like it. Don't forget to let me know if you do on Instagram at We Dive Deeper. And my own personal page is at Kate McGill. You could also support the podcast, patreon.com slash Kate McGill. Okay, without further ado, here is me. So, hello. Um, obviously, I've had Dan on the podcast before, um, but this time around, we thought it might be fun to do it, him asking me the questions, even though you've heard plenty from me over the past, what, 10 weeks? No, maybe even longer. I think this started back in February. Uh, but yeah, we thought it might be fun for Dan to ask me questions, and we may as well dive in deep. No small talk. No small talk at all. The- so I am going to pick number... 16. 16. Okay. Uh, which parent are you closer to and why? That was a very... <laughs> wow. <laughs> straight in with, straight with a parental in. question. Well, I mean, uh, it would have been mum. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is still mum, I think. Yeah. If you can be close to a dead person. Um, I, think I, I think I was always close to my mum. And that's not to a fault of my dad. It's just, as you may have heard on the podcast, he is... He's a bit of an enigma, really. He is quite reserved. He's not great at being emotionally vulnerable. He wasn't very tactile or affectionate when we were younger. Um, And if he was, it kind of felt a bit weird. (laughs) Um, And so he, he was, I think he played the classic male role and he went out and did the work and would come back and tell us all to go to bed. Like that was kind of dad's role. And it's only been in the last... I don't know, eight years, I literally made that up, Um, that he has started to be kind of more involved in our lives emotionally too. But even now, I think, um, I think naturally we're all all pretty separate, whereas mum was the glue and she held us all together. So I'd say mum and I wish I was still close to her now, physically. I mean, I think it's interesting because um, from from knowing you for seven years now, six years, Have seven years. you made years, that up too? No, 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 no. Right. Like, I think, I mean, it was around the time Metal Arc started. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, I definitely, there was a, there was a moment, a turning point where, because when I first met you, you were, you were still quite sour with your dad, I guess. Right. Or at least, I don't, I think you had a relationship, but it was, there was, you hadn't Some quite Some kind of resentment there. And I remember you, that did change after like two years and he became... Like, your mum was always your mum, for sure. Like, you were always, like, she was the most important, I think, for you as a role model and who you looked to. But then your dad became this other thing, other person where I remember you having uh, questions about yourself and and things that only he could answer, really. Beyond love, you needed, like, someone with, like, expertise and someone who had, like, knowledge. And there was this point where he became a really important, like, for a year or two, I think it was. So Yeah, that's so true, actually. Um besides the fact that he was a GP and stuff and I you kind of had to be vulnerable enough to be like dad I need this sorting or this mental health thing and that's kind of how we connected more emotionally was when I wanted stuff to be sorted with my own brain and I knew that he was actually going to be the only one to be able to help me and mum of course being counsellor but um yeah I kind of forgot about that and I think with me my three other siblings don't have the kind of relationship with dad that I do which I feel very grateful to have but it means that I can ask him the questions that no one really wants to ask him which can be uncomfortable for everyone (laughs) but 
in doing that, um, our relationship has become much closer. And what I've realized about dad is that you can't upset him, really. You can't make him uncomfortable um, because he will tell you himself, like, that's all him. That's all his stuff. If he feels that, that's him. So if I have questions about the past and how he can rectify it with us, then I just ask them. And we never used to have that relationship. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm probably closer to him now, but only because I have to be. Yeah. yeah that's <laughs> um okay let's go for 34 do you know what was really interesting i what? had this i had this like premonition that you had memorized all of these and you were going to ask specific ones oh really so i was going to do this thing where like i was going to add a number to like ah, to like sort of like throw, throw you off. off but when you just sent the questions through like 10 minutes ago to me i realized that there's just no way you could memorize <laughs> no this many questions hell. plus that so wouldn't be like me to do no i, I want to no, be caught no. off guard no of course of course in my mind i was like I'll, I'll ask <laughs> yeah her. um is that 34 did you say yeah okay out of the negative emotions of greed anger jealousy and hate which one affects you the most jealousy i think um anger i don't think I ever feel anger. Oh, well, I don't know what that feels like in me. I feel like I've felt frustration to a crazy degree and I've been pent up, but it's never come out. It's like I've never lashed out at someone or um, been in any way violent or that kind of anger. I've never experienced mm. that. Um, maybe it's in me somewhere, but not enough to notice it. Greed, um, I think in the kind of materialistic ways, like I'll always want more clothes or I want more food and stuff. But I think that's, even I know in those moments, like that isn't gonna make my life better or affect me. But recently actually I've been um, really practicing gratitude every morning and um, like I get in the shower and I talk to myself and I'm like, right, okay, what am I grateful for today? And I start listing the things that I'm grateful for, family, career. And I really, really think about it in my brain so that I can feel how lucky I am when I'm, when I'm saying it. And I'm just like, thank you, thank you, thank you. And in, <laughs> in that way, <clears throat> it's very hard to feel like you're lacking anything because I'm really not lacking anything. Like I'm so lucky. And what is it? Like we're in the top 1% of people in the world or something when you have X amount of money. And um, so I've got nothing at all to be in lack of. So greed, I don't think I struggle with. Um, hate, I, yeah, I just don't think I could hate anyone. Because I think at this point in my life, like I've said a million times to everyone, you just work out that everyone is just the sum total events of their life. And if you were, if you had been born as them, grown up in that family, went to that school, blah, 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 you would be that person too. And you'd make those decisions and feel those emotions. So it's hard to hate anyone, as well as the fact that as cheesy as it sounds, we are literally all one <laughs> and we're all part of one big consciousness of this universe. Um, how could you hate anyone? It just baffles me. Jealousy, however, I think I definitely feel too often, more often than I'd like. Definitely in relationships, that's something I struggle with. But I think that was born out of a massive insecurity of not feeling worthy enough for a certain person or a certain relationship um and that my brain just went there every time and it was very hard to get out of it even though I knew objectively no I'm a good person I'm worthy of you know unconditional love I would find myself in those moments and be like damn it they are really pretty though and they're much thinner and um I'd say I struggle with that, but I'd I'd love to think that the work I've been doing on myself recently would lead me to a point of not being jealous, but I won't know really until I'm put that in that position again. But it definitely mostly comes out in relationships. That's where I feel it most. And just saying that now, it's probably because of that um, stupid pattern I have of putting someone on a pedestal, making them this the most amazing thing ever. So naturally, I'm going to make myself feel insecure when they do out, go out with other people. Um, so yeah, it's all it's all my stuff, really. I think relationships just bring jealousy out of me. When and I was about to say, when do you think it sort of started? Or when do you when did you sort of 
do you think jealousy was always a relationship thing or do you think there was a point in your life where it's it, did it manifest itself from something earlier on in life into that or or was it literally like got a boyfriend and got jealous <laughs> um well I mean the thing that sticks out was my first relationship um hello Dave if you're listening I highly doubt you are but um there annoyingly there was a kind of a trio in our relationship it wasn't just me and Dave there was always this friend um, and they were naturally very close and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but when you're a 16 17 18 year old you cannot see things that clearly and you can't you just think oh he's close to another girl that means x y and z um and like my prom night I mean who has a prom in the UK but prom um I was like a fifth wheel with my two other friends and their boyfriends and he was outside smoking with this girl and stuff. And so I think that set the tone pretty much for every relationship and that ended because he broke it up. So it just, the spiral starts there. You start thinking, oh, there wasn't anything right with me and he is going to be happier elsewhere. And even though you know that that's not right. Yeah, like I said, in my 29 year old brain, I wouldn't let myself think like that right now. But at 18 it was very I could let myself go crazy with those thoughts and I think that manifested then in every relationship but now now what's good is that I know that that is a it's a conscious thought now it's not an unconscious acting out from me so hopefully in future relationships or relationship hopefully um I can see things clearer and not uh yeah not let myself because I think those maybe those patterns are still going to come up and I'm still going to feel those feelings but I don't need to run with them anymore and I don't need to let them control me in my relationship I can see them black and white hopefully <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting and so you, yeah so you believe that it was like a learned like jealousy is kind of a learned thing or like from a, an experience that sets it or, or at least shows you that side of yourself and then you sort of carry that with you and, yeah uh, and I guess in that same way then it, it's curable that jealousy is not something we have to live with I think a lot of people that I know uh, and the, out of those four um, emotions, emotions yeah. they definitely, a lot of people believe that those they're just something they have. That's something you have and you just have to deal with. But I do think from learning how you get them, it shows that they didn't, well, they, we, didn't we weren't born jealous. Yeah. Um, that those are things that we pick up on the way and they're therefore probably things we can discard yeah. before we get to the end. <laughs> yeah, I quite, I quite like that. And I think <clears throat> you can... Um, You can do that with every emotion. I think, you know, emotions are going to crop up. You can't just disregard every emotion and only want happiness. It's not going to happen. But if you can see them for just what they are, triggered by something else or a situation or a person, then you can know when to remove yourself or how to work on that. You know, you can... They don't have, you don't have to be a slave to them, essentially. You can... I I also think, especially in a relationship, I think jealousy can be an important tool as well mm. it depends on how you let it affect you i think but I, I think um i know from from being in a relationship that like sometimes i like to feel jealous i like to be reminded that i that i care and i'd care if i lost it you know yeah i think if i went through i, I I've, and i've met people who aren't jealous in any way in their relationship and i do feel like it lacks uh there needs to be some fear you know what i mean i think fear is is an important part of life um, and we need the, just the right amount, really. We yeah. Too much and we get anxiety and we get all these mental health issues because we're driven by fear and it's just living there all the time. But to, to push us and drive us, and I think that as beings, at one point that was what did throw us. You know, I mean, it was like, we're going to get eaten, we need to run away, or we're not going to starve, we need to get some food. Like, we need to get up and go. And yeah. that is fear. And uh, but I think it's become a big part of everyone's lives now. Mm. But, um, but, but yeah, I think I think the right amount is important. I think jealousy. So I think for, it's interesting hearing you say about you sort of like getting that thought and, and learning from it and, and dealing with it as it crops up. Because then you might be able to get it to that, that good level and, yeah. you know, not that overriding thing where it suddenly ruins, <laughs> it, it sort of protrudes yeah, out exactly. of your thought. It's safe in there, but it, when it comes to here and you start verbalizing it. Exactly. I think you need to, you need to know when when to let it out when it's good to be jealous because mm-hmm. that jealousy could teach you actually something really isn't right here maybe my partner's cheating on right. me yeah, <laughs> like yeah. it could take you there but a lot of the time if you can see that it's born purely out of your insecurity yeah and there's not actually anything to be jealous of that's when you know that it's your stuff and yeah. not theirs that's very true i didn't really think about that that often 
the the jealousy you might be feeling was a manifestation of your own thought exactly. and assumption that sort of turns into a reality in your mind yeah i think you know if you were a really confident secure person in your relationship and you started to feel jealous that's probably a good fucking hint to be like maybe something's not totally. right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. very interesting okay Another let's one. go with with going through these today mm-hmm. it feels weird answering these i'm not gonna lie yeah yeah i like I am naturally an open person, especially with you, but I feel like, I just feel like I don't know what I'm saying. But then sometimes it's good just to let the unconscious just start spitting yeah. things out. Oh and my then... God, is it doing that? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, 58. 58. Okay. Uh, oh, this is a very interesting one. Have you ever had a religious experience? <laughs> oh man. So here we are. We finally get to tell the Meadowlark story. Yeah. Well, okay. maybe even go back slightly before then. I mean, yeah, you went from being start at the beginning. Like, yeah. have you ever have you ever been religious? Well, okay, so I was definitely born. Mum sent us to Catholic schools. That mm-hmm. was always a thing growing up. We kind of went to midnight mass every now and again. Um, but and was, very... that, was that because your family were religious, or was it more about getting the right education? Yeah, I think it was more that. But mum, mum kind of grew up Catholic and okay. had that mindset for a definitely while we were children anyway it wasn't strict by any means i think she was just like oh i'll enjoy them if they go to that school um but quickly quickly learn in that type of environment that um you know like that song the key that i wrote on the replaced album (laughs) shout out um it kind of quickly learned that in school when you're like at mass and there's just herds of children just chanting the same prayer and no one has a fucking clue what they're saying or what it means or where it's come from. Like you just have been taught to say it and you can regurgitate it. That was, it, that felt very um, cult-like. And I remember just looking around being like, this is fucking weird. So I like very quickly learned to just not engage with that um, religious aspect at all. And then when I was 20, um, just before the replaced album, my manager at the time was like, go and work with this guy um, up in Bristol. And so I came up here and I didn't know at the time, but the complex where we were working on music was kind of a Christian complex, that thing. So everyone that I was meeting throughout those coming weeks were Christian people. And thank God I went there because I have met two of my absolute best friends there (laughs) that remain my best friends to this day. Um, but I also met some people that shaped my life in a crazy way. Um, not necessarily the best way, but it's, you know, it all comes around and you, you learn and grow. Um, I probably I probably won't go into that in too much detail, but because of this experience that I had whilst writing Recording Replaced, I very much delved into kind of the Christian culture and the Christian way of living. And I went to some Christian festivals um, and really kind of committed to that for a while and really thought that that was the way I wanted to go, I guess. And um, I moved into Bristol then up from Plymouth and started living with Emily and Kat, my two best friends who are Christians um, and another girl. And it just, it very quickly became my way of life. And so I started kind of praying more. And actually a lot of the stuff that I do now spiritually is all very much the same. Like I learned how to be really, really generous and really grateful for things and to focus on the good in people and all that (laughs) stuff that's in every religion that unites every religion that was very much the catalyst for me becoming this person that I am today. Um, And I'm sure that you remember times when you met Kat and Emily and they completely changed your life because Mm -hmm. they're just such happy, positive people. So that was an amazing start. But to get on to the Meadowlark thing, um, my brain and memory is so hazy. So I can probably help fill in the facts. (laughs) My like dates and stuff, I don't know, but I guess, yeah, it must have been around 2012, 2013, no, 2012, end of 2012. Um, And I wanted to stop the YouTube thing. I think I'd gotten to the point where I, all these covers on YouTube were doing really well. Sorry, what's wrong with me today? Frog in my throat. All the covers on YouTube were doing well. If you searched Kate McGill on Google, it was just 
she's known for her cover of Mumford and Sons and Adele and and I was like damn I really don't want to be known for this stuff and I just felt a very big a gut instinct that I should just not do YouTube anymore it wasn't fueling my solo stuff it wasn't fueling my creativity for songwriting it was just making me cover other people's songs um, and I knew that I didn't really want to do that so I made a very impulsive very impulsive which is me all over video and just said that this is my last ever YouTube video I don't want to do this anymore I want to focus on my own stuff and then just after that I think you came up to see the tallest man on earth in Bristol and we hadn't really like been that friendly since you did the cursed video for me um but we all went out we went to ramshackle like we had the best time and I was at the same time yeah these are where my dates get hazy and then you left and I remember ringing you after being like do you want to would you fancy like writing together sometime and you were like that is crazy like me and Carl have just had the exact same thoughts that would be absolutely amazing and it wasn't long until I came down to Plymouth and we were writing together and it felt so natural and easy and it was at that moment I was like damn this is this is why, why I quit the YouTube thing like I'm so like I really think that when when something's right for you doors will just open that's what's meant to happen um so we started writing together everything felt really easy and we kind of knew that we wanted to make this band a thing and then it came down to picking the name for the band so this is where the religious experience this is where the religious experience comes in so I was on my way back from Plymouth thinking of names for the band and I started thinking of um loads of bird names because I just thought bird names were cool and I feel like it, we had like field fair and skylark and meadowlark and stuff so I was writing them all down and I feel like I'm gonna forget something writing them all down and then I got home and I was talking with Emily and Kat and the girls about this band name and the whole decision and that was it I was getting uh, lots of comments on the YouTube video this last ever YouTube video being like this is a bad decision you're just throwing this all away and that was kind of eating away at my brain so I thought am I and I really feel like this is right but it's, maybe this isn't right um and so yeah I was thinking all these names and Emily my best friend she was like do you mind if I like pray with you and for you that this this will all become a bit more clearer and that you have a bit more clarity about this decision and the band and whatever else so I was like okay cool so she prayed for me in her room and you know that was it didn't really think anything of it and then we were all in the lounge like an hour or so later we were listening to Christian music I think I mean I make it sound like we were these crazy crazy <laughs> Jesus loving people it really wasn't that intense no. it was very chill um, we were listening to music and I was looking at this YouTube video and it, back in the day on YouTube you could have video responses like no one can remember YouTube like that but you could have video responses and um, I saw that there was just one video response and the thumbnail was a picture of a meadowlark and I had only ever seen this bird like four hours previously on the train because it's such a distinct bird it's got a yellow belly and a black v and, and, and no one no like knew, i hadn't even yeah, yeah didn't even know like i'd literally just thought of this name for a yeah. band earlier i don't think you'd even told us this no idea. i hadn't i think we had like a facebook group we yeah, <laughs> which we is did. weird yeah. um so i saw this um thumbnail and i was like what the hell i swear to god that's a meadowlark this is so strange so I clicked on the video and everything was like in Spanish I think and the I shit you not the title in Spanish to English said something like from the beyond or like beyond I'm not even joking and the video was pictures of a meadowlark pictures of me and pictures of the cross and <laughs> It was, uh, and like, what the actual hell? How could you explain that? So I was just dumbfounded. And I was like say, saying to Emily and Kat, like, look at this. Like, where the hell is this come from? I had not said this name to anyone. Um, and I just remember kind of crying my eyes out at that point. Because I was like, could you get a more clearer sign? Even now I was saying it, I'm like, did I make this all up? Because that no, is you fucking showed, crazy. You showed me the video. Yeah. And I was like, surely 
one of those two went and did it, but they didn't. <laughs> no. And so I'm just, it, it is kind of mad that someone just, I mean, they may have just made it and put the bird in because they're like, that's a nice bird. And it sort of signifies whatever it signifies. But it was specifically a Meadowlark and we, and you'd specifically had fell in love with that band name and it was, yeah. It was crazy. And then just after that, my friend Kat, she was like, I've got you a Christmas present, but I really think I should give it to you now. And she came in and there was, was like this card. I think it was a card, again, hazy memory, with a bird on it. And it said, um, be brave, you were born to fly. And I was like, <laughs> I just felt like everything yeah. was just colliding. And I was like, okay, well, I guess Meadowlark's the name of our band. And it was, it really was a crazy experience. But even, even that, I I don't think I could put that down to Jesus. I I don't know. I don't know. And I'm not, I can't I mean, claim I think, to know we, the world and the way like, it yeah, works. We, but I know definitely in the last couple of years, we've sort of said the universe shows us. Mm. And I think, and that's, and, and I think from, from an observational point of view, from where you've gone from that, and like you were saying earlier, it sort of, it has, you do sort of pray now. It's, it just isn't to someone, it's to everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, and, and to yourself as well, I think. Um, I have no idea where I was going to about to go. I had to go on an absolute tangent on a, but yeah, I think um, it's just it's very similar basically, and I feel like you know where you say now it's I don't, you don't think it was Jesus, but it definitely was something. It was a sign. It, it was a sign if not from anywhere. Exactly. But it sent you on this path, and sometimes we just I don't know. It's nice to have a reminder that we're on the right track. Yeah, and, no and that, where that comes it, from. What an amazing way to start the band though, because mm. even even you guys and Carl, bless him, not in the kind of airy fairy space that I was, I think even he was like, that's fucking weird. Um, and then to start that metal art journey and then have the Bastille show and Gabrielle Upman shows and stuff, I think what, it was such a solid thing to start this band yeah, on. And I that's that will forever remain a very cool section of yeah. life. Um, but do you believe in fate? And what do you like? What's your opinions on kind of spirituality and stuff? I don't know about. I don't think something's written in for us. I think things can change, but I I do believe that there is something that steers us, whether it's our own uh, something above the layer of consciousness that we live on, or whether it's something above that. Um, I I don't really know, and I find it really hard to explain, or because uh, it's not not a tangible thing. Yeah, it's difficult to imagine what that even looks like. And... I think that that is spirituality, though. Mm-hmm. It cannot be explained and can't be seen. It, you can't like it can be tangible enough at some points if you have those experiences but you can't explain it you yeah. can write it down with words i mean if you think about it as humans we've kind of defied the laws of i don't know animals i mean we, we, we were once animals and we've evolved and the only issue is now that we need to catch up consciously um you know we always hear this on podcasts and we talk about it um and I think that's exactly what spirituality is, is, is as well. I think it's as much about us as it is about everyone else and about how we combine ourselves. You know, I mean, it's mm-hmm. with, uh, you know, there's been lots of things over time where greed's got into play and conservatism and people sort of think about themselves and their family. And I guess there is a sort of element of like, I must protect what is mine and what's close. But I think we're at a stage now where like we've created some of a world, not all of it. There's many dangerous places to live and not everyone's getting that kind of care. But a, a world where we now can start thinking about everyone else mm-hmm. as well. And maybe start thinking about, you know, why is it in, like, the earth is tiny. And, and yet, like, there's these invisible lines that yeah. say, oh, over here you're allowed to have all this stuff for free. And you get looked after. And over here you're in poverty and famine. And that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. That's your life you're born in. It's like, I don't feel like that's, that's right, surely. It's mental. And um, I know this is completely not like that, but... Even I was just randomly thinking the other day, like, oh, man, how cool would it be to live in L.A. for a bit? And I was like, oh, probably couldn't do that as easily as I wanted. You mm-hmm. can't just Up you can't go. just go a couple like thousand miles and just go live somewhere. You no. literally just can't. You're not allowed. And mm-hmm. if you can, you have to pay a shitload of money and go through a hell of a lot of hoops just to live somewhere else on this planet. It's yeah. mental. Yeah, yeah. Because you get the the all the perks, I guess, the perks of that place. But it, it's just very interesting that we haven't sort of that everyone hasn't got together and just made a blanket world. But maybe it wouldn't work. I don't know. Maybe yeah. there's the yin and yang. There has to be this pain and suffering for there to be... And I don't know. I mean, it's difficult to say. You know, and people... I've listened to dozens of people talk about the utopian dream. And then when they start delving into it, they realise actually that, you know, it's, would that work? Would that even work? I don't yeah. Know. I like to think it would on a human level that we could all live in harmony, but... 
but that, I, that's why I think and yeah that maybe this is where my spirituality comes to into play but I think things have to become spiritual in a way to evolve now like we've done as much as we can physically <laughs> I feel like we need to go up into a higher level of consciousness where you that because it's only then that you realize how one we all are and we are just and then that layer above the consciousness that quietness that's what we all are it's all this other crap stuff in the middle that we're not (laughs) and I think it's only until you can get some sense of that that you'd stop being angry greedy jealous all that kind of stuff I think the sad thing is that the internet and I it always comes into a conversation but it is kind of stopping that happening it is because we've got this window now and jealousy and greed and stuff it's so apparent um and we're not we're not we're like a hive mind but like a computer hive mind where we're fed what we're meant to like through advertising and through everyone else's ideas i don't think you have to very much be i mean you're at the moment practicing it and finding a way to like quiet your mind and come out of that and and to do things but that's only a a certain part of a day and uh, you know other times we're connected and we're then absorbing and regurgitating that and it becomes like we're fed things. Yeah. I think the only way we could become, I guess, a society or a, a huge collective consciousness of everyone on the same level is if that disappeared and we could start seeing people as humans, not as a window into this advertising world. I don't know. I think I, think I disagree because all this stuff is going to be here regardless. We can't get rid of Mm. all of this stuff it's here I think it's about learning to use it as a tool to teach you all that stuff so you know yes I meditate you feel good but it is to keep you going throughout the day so when I'm on my phone on Twitter and I start being like oh god that person's this I start being judgmental or whatever the meditation and that quietness teaches you to be like none of this this doesn't matter I'm going to put down my phone it's making me feel all these feelings having these thoughts they're not it's not real it's not yeah. what matters right. so you put that right. down and you're like it's, it kind of gives you the perspective shift that you need and i think ev- there's everyone has enough of something and i think everyone's realizing that now you know with social media you kind of you know when your limit is now because you've had so much of it it's like you know what actually i've realized after five years of using it intensely that it's not good for me anymore so I'm at my peak. I'm going to start only using it for a couple of hours a day. And you kind of need the entourage of it all to then realize where to go, you know? That's very true. Mm. I guess, yeah, I guess if, if that was the way people were educated now is to sort of to start viewing it that way, then yeah, you are probably right. It could become an asset and a tool that is picked up and used rather than something that sort of... Yeah. And like people, it drives people, you know? Yeah. Because so, um, that's yeah. This, this, you know, this book, The Power of Now, I'm sure many people have read it. But he kind of says that about um, like any emotion or anything that you're feeling or someone's being really annoying or there's a car alarm or something. Use that to rather than just get sit there and be annoyed at it, which is resisting the moment as it is. You mm-hmm. can't get rid of it. So you may as well learn to be at peace with it and to use it to be more present, you know, and it's fucking hard <laughs> not claiming in any way to yeah. assess it because I'm still doing it every day. But I think if you can use it, you can only you can only go up then. It doesn't have to keep you down in this horrible state, you know? Yeah, very true. Very true. Okay. New let's number. go for um eighty two. Oh, there is no eighty two. No, up to sixty nine. <laughs> oh, oh up to sixty nine. Wait, there were meant to be seventy. Okay. Um why did I think eighty two? Uh okay. Sixty six. Sixty six. Okay. Uh, are are you good at taking criticism? <laughs> uh, everything in me wants to say yes, but I don't think so. And you're shaking your head like, <laughs> no. <laughs> both, both of us aren't. I don't think we're, we're very protective of our art. So. Yeah, I think I've had a couple, um, especially when it comes to music. Mm. And my ex will gladly share in this story too. But I think I was showing him appetite. And he like, there was something in it that made him laugh. And that was it. I was like, I was shut down. I was like, no, I'm never showing you anything ever again. And even though I could very much see myself doing that, like objectively, like, Kate, just go and show him the song. It's not a big deal. Everything in you is so hurt. Um, I'd like, I think music, yeah. I am not in any way good at taking criticism. I'd like to think 
if someone kind of not attacked but said something about the way I was being I'd like to think that I'd be able to hear that because I want to be better I want to be a better person for everyone um but it's weird I think if someone was to kind of criticize something I'd say I'd probably feel even more defensive because I'd be like what the hell I've done so much work on myself like why are you saying that? I'm obviously not meaning to do that, blah, blah, blah. And I'd probably get more defensive. And I know me and my stepsister, stepsister? Fucking hell. Sister-in-law have had um, those kind of conversations. So I think it's something I'm working on. <laughs> yeah. So the answer is no, you're not. Ready I don't to... think I am, though. No. But then I, I don't know many people that are, and especially given the kind of volatile world we live in now where criticism is delivered quite harshly. I mean, it's you're no longer bumping shoulders and be like, oh, I wasn't a fan of that thing you did the other day. Now it's like someone just saying outright the worst things possible from behind the computer screen exactly. or the phone. Um, but yeah, so I think everyone now is, and also I think we're in a, in a world where everyone feels like they're allowed to be right and what they're doing is right, no, no matter what. Mm-hmm. Everyone's now become like a critic or like, a, but also a, a leader of some sort. But you um, do like a lot, a lot of stuff. Like how, and you have to get criticism really when people are like, change this i don't like this like how do you deal with that i mean it's it sucks i mean but sometimes you can sort of if it's not it doesn't feel as personal when you've sort of you've done something for money and then someone's criticizing you like well it was the best of my ability you don't like it and i I think over time i've learned to be like to to understand that we have just different tastes as Mm -hmm. humans and that what i deem is really good or tastes really good or whatever someone else can be like it's horrible or i don't like that look or and it could be down to like stupid things when you really break it down you know why they don't like it you think that's just there's going to be a differing opinion here yeah um what it really reflects is how they tell you and i think that says more about them the way they criticize than how for me it's the only way to criticize is constructively it's not fair to go i just don't like it it's rubbish it's like well what why is it rubbish is it something you think they could change if not then why are you telling it you know yeah like bring solutions not problems. yeah totally and and so so when someone else delivers me that i then try and imagine what they're trying like what the criticism is you know it's like when you when break it down and be like well they said that maybe it means maybe it means this so maybe like i can discard 80 percent of their criticism because it's just hard it's just not very nice but maybe 20 percent is 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 right maybe that it's something they didn't like about that that's something i need to look at yeah and then take that and apply it in a very gentle way and not change my life because of it yeah has has getting more criticism just because that's your job helped you yeah. get criticism yeah Are you but less kind of sensitive to it now i think so but certain things are di- more difficult <laughs> yeah. it depends how much personal like uh Time interest, yeah, it, yeah how much energy you put into something because then then it does feel it's, it's i mean you you know like <laughs> <laughs> when i send you songs <laughs> i don't like it it's like oh damn <laughs> you know yeah. and it takes a day for me to sort of like to, to register that and then Lick we go back and, yeah and, and go <laughs> yeah. back and listen to it and go yeah, do you know what maybe it's not that good you know yeah. like you're just attached to it because it's new and fresh and, and it's it is so natural if you're going to spend that much time and energy on something and you're building it mm. and building stuff that you like on it of yeah. course you're going to be like huh yeah um that's yeah that's difficult I, that's that's just a that's never going to get easy is it, it? I just won't. <laughs> it's just I, it's just, and yeah, when it's such a per- art is personal and for me the, the the job the video stuff is so easy to be like if you don't like it that's cool whatever but like the the music's very difficult yeah because <laughs> it's like that feels like i'm just taking a little bit of my soul and putting it across the table <laughs> and being like what do you think and i was like well no it's like, yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah. So it's, but that's 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 a me thing you know it's not down to other people yeah so. what an interesting question i know i do like that one yeah okay let's go for nothing above 70k um 21 21 okay um if you had the ability to erase something that you did in the past, what would it be? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, God, Dan, you were there. I was. Oh, my God. <laughs> you still think about it. I do. I still think about yeah. it every day. It tears right. me up. Tell us a story. This is so going to be a boring... I mean, maybe it's not going to be a boring because maybe it shows something very animalistic in me. But me and Dan were just walking through Bristol and oh god i'm ashamed to say it this guy dropped like a tenner 20 pound note 20 20 pound even worse (laughs) dropped 20 pound note on the floor i saw him drop it and nothing in me went to pick it up and give it to him it was such a like instinctive run and grab it and start walking away and naturally i mean it happened in like split seconds i didn't know what you'd done exactly you just zipped off 
came Go-ship. back and, I, and then some guy well, yeah. yeah and then the guy obviously saw me pick it up and came back and was like can I have my money please and I was like oh my god of course sorry and after that I was like Kate what the hell like why did you just it was steal that baffling yeah like so and so like not in my character <laughs> no. to do that but it felt so I don't know and there's a, there's another time <laughs> get it out <laughs> yeah the, and this is it's just crazy it just shows how you can hopefully grow and learn so mm. much but i must have been like 10 and there was this i told you this I right understand. you're like I fucking know. <laughs> there was this girl that lived like just up the road <laughs> and um it was her birthday just to make things 10 times worse and she i went up we were in her bedroom she was really excited because her parents gave her money and that was a ten pound because I remember that. And she was like, "Yeah, mum and dad gave me ten pound, or mummy and daddy at that point, I don't know." And then she went to the toilet, and I went in the drawer and nicked it. I just nicked the ten pound from her drawer on her birthday, and went <laughs> home. And I remember saying to mum, "Like, oh, they just gave me ten pounds." She obviously saw that bullshit and was like, "Obviously, that never happened. Why would they just give you money?" Never saw that tenner again. So essentially, mum stole the 10 pound and if you want to make a dead woman feel guilty go for it so okay <laughs> so this is really interesting because who does that yeah and and like the, the person i know d- doesn't do that <laughs> so, so it's definitely something that buried deep in you because i mean for example you raised how much money for charity for eight grand eight grand yeah. for fasting for like five mm-hmm. days um <laughs> well done me so anyway. so yeah well done. um it's incredible to raise that much money like so altruistically as well like to to give to something else um so those when i hear those stories and i witness one definitely like it i mean like i said you just peeled off for a second came back and then before i even asked where you went some guy tapped on the shoulder and i was like what just happened and you sort of came out of the haze like i don't know what i just did <laughs> I don't oh, know why. It's horrible. So, so I definitely think. So, I what's an interesting thing for me is: Do you think that came from somewhere, you, like maybe not having, or someone you saw take took something and that was deemed okay? Like where? I, I mean, maybe very, like very possibly, but I definitely didn't grow up in lack. Like mum and dad, we were fine. Like dad was a doctor, um, we lived in a nice house. Like there wasn't any lack there so there'd be no need for me to steal i think we all, i mean i say we all maybe this is a moment where i find out we all didn't do this but as kids or definitely as children you'd always kind of get <laughs> maybe you would i'd always go into like mum's purse and take a couple pounds okay, or like okay, 10 okay. p right. and stuff um but I always... Well, just, I think that's the origin. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I always just assumed every kid did that. But I've, like... <laughs> I have to make clear, I do not think theft is good. I don't <laughs> think you should do it. It's not right. Um, and I would never in a million years do that today. But, um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe it came from stealing money from mum's purse. I think it... I feel like it has to. I mean, and, uh, interestingly enough, I had an experience when I was seven where I think we were in Ikea... Which is, we, we didn't have a local Ikea, so I remember it being quite a big day out to go to one, maybe in London or something, or Southampton, I think it was. Um, not that it really matters. And we were at the cashier, and it was hectic. I mean, Ikea is mental, and when you're like seven or eight, or whatever it was, I was, however old I was, it was pretty crazy. And I remember finding 20 pounds on the floor, and I, and I sort of picked it up, and I was a bit confused, and I was like, who, no one, no one sort of was rushing to me. So I went to my dad and said, like, I've just found this. And he's like, well, hold it up and see if anyone it is anyone's so i held it up literally just stood there in in the little part after the cashier sort of bit when the lane where everyone sort of peels off just held this money up and eventually my dad obviously scanned all the stuff and was like right when no one's collected it no one's come to you you've asked people right you can have that it's yours and i was like okay so i wonder if you know having experience like that then sort of taught me very concretely like if you find money always make you know, sure that it isn't someone else's yeah. first and I remember multiple experiences of finding wallets and stuff and just and my dad like, don't even open it just hand it straight in don't even look Yeah. Like, don't even think because you'll see the money and you'll take it yeah so, I think I'd say I'd like I, no I think that if I saw a wallet I don't think anything would me open it up and take money no I really don't think I'd no. have that in me if it was someone's wallet with cards and stuff 
I'd hand that in. But if I a think note it falls was, from the hand. Yeah, I think if it's just like, just money. Yeah. Because there's a sense of belonging when it's in a wallet. Yeah, do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. When there's just, even if you have just seen someone, you literally know who it belongs to. Mm-hmm. When there's just a note that's just money on the floor, I feel yeah. like in my head, maybe that's just, that doesn't belong to anyone. It's on the yeah, floor. Yeah, yeah. My, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where my crazy brain, no. but that was what, that must have been, what, only like five years ago that yeah, that happened. Yeah, less probably, I think, yeah. It no, was last week. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, it happened this morning before we started yeah. the podcast. Okay, right. Let's do one more. I feel like actually we've gone on loads. We've, really? We've got loads, but I so I should have looked at the time really when we started. But... Uh, I think it was around 12.38 when you sent me the questions. So it wasn't far off we started. Okay, cool. So, um, Oh yeah, question. I mean, yeah. uh, 28. 28 is... Uh, when have you caused the most harm to yourself? Ooh, that is a good question. When have I caused the most harm to myself? I mean, physically, there was definitely a period when I was 18. And even like now looking back, it's again, so unlike me to do this, but I cut my wrists a couple times and that was purely out of a crazy heartbreak the first love just broken up with me and I was just so sad. Um, and I remember listening to like James Morrison, the pieces don't fit anymore with my headphones. And I feel like it was a Saturday night cause Steven and his friends were in the garage. Can of remember it, but just, it wasn't out of like a, you know, people who self harm have, you know, mental health problems. This was just me probably being a bit, dramatic and I, I mean that purely for me let me just clarify I think self-harm needs to be dealt with and I think it's important but for me at that time it wasn't out of a you know I don't want to live anymore or I hate myself it so, was... uh, so when we say cut wrist are, are we talk talking like they you it wasn't like a I mean we talking cut cut or are we talking no like scrap? tiny slits right, like okay. tiny slits right, right, right. um yeah you know, I I don't even I can't even tend to know what my mentality was I can't remember what I was thinking but probably just a 18 year old girl I'm really really sad how can I show the world I'm more sad you know I don't think it was anything more than that I Mm. never did it again um but yeah I think that's probably the most physical harm I've caused myself but emotionally bloody hell every single day tormenting myself um definitely last year before mum died just in my kind of depressive hole um and being in that relationship I my self-esteem was so low and I would just berate myself daily about how fat I was or how much I didn't deserve whatever was happening for me and you know just just constant constant berating myself for whatever reason um and that caused me a lot of emotional harm and probably will carry me through the next few years, all these kind of thoughts and stuff. But one thing for sure that I know now is that I just do not let myself talk about myself like that in my head anymore. It just doesn't happen. And as soon as it does, I actively stop and say, no, I don't talk about myself like that anymore. Um, and it just, it's crazy. I can't even, I don't even know when it happened. It's just, I do not let myself talk badly about myself anymore, which I'm so glad about because I don't deserve to be spoken to like that by myself or anyone. And when you think about, you know, the classic, would you talk to your friend like that? Of course you wouldn't, regardless of who they are, what they've done, what situation they're in, they deserve love and forgiveness and everything in between. You'd never speak to them like that. So why would you yourself? And that is one of the biggest things I've learned is just to be kinder to yourself. Like we're all, we're all really struggling. We all have problems. We all have really, really crap days. Things can be really, really crap. So give yourself a break when you're struggling or if you make a mistake or you say the wrong thing to someone, it doesn't make you a bad person. It just makes you a human in this world trying to figure stuff out. And as long as you can see things for what they are and you're like, okay, I don't want to do that again. I don't want to act in this way again. I want to be better. That's all you can do. Um, and so, yeah, I caused myself a lot of emotional harm just throughout living, but I 
refuse to do that anymore. I don't deserve it. I think it's been like the biggest thing as a friend watching you go through it is the transformation between that Kate and the Kate I'm sat across the table with now, which is pretty incredible, um, especially given circumstantially what's happened. I mean, you were already in the worst place I've ever seen you prior to your mum passing away and jo- and your boyfriend leaving you. Um, and I think to, to to have that baggage anyway, to go through that stuff and then to be like, it's just, yeah, have to praise it. So. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, and it's incredible. What about you? Have you ever caused yourself physical or emotional harm? I mean, you're kind of going through something right now. Is that something you'd be up yeah. for sharing? I guess, I guess, yeah. I mean, maybe not full detail because I don't even know what it is. Yeah. Um, I definitely think I've maybe like burnt. And now I think I now I've felt what burning yourself out feels like. Right. I don't think physically, um, if that's what it is. Um, I, I seem to have some symptoms at the moment that suggest that <laughs> I'm not well. <laughs> um, and speaking to doctors and nurses, I feel like they're very much thinking it could be like an anxiety related thing, um, which in which case would be self self-caused i think um from just overworking taking too much on um and i yeah i feel like but i've never i never have hurt myself purposely physically i don't think ever um not not intended to anyway this seems to be like you know not an intention yeah of course but it is interesting i mean in those moments you you have a bit of a wake-up call and realize that like you have a choice it when you're in those dark moments and whatever's happened to you um, and you, you're, you've caused this harm, whether you meant to or not. That is then a, a, a road. You can pick two paths. One is to carry on exactly the same way, which is what you said you had as well. But in both situations, you said phys- the physical harm and the emotional, or you change it because. And it seems crazy to think anyone would want it, would want to stand that path. And it is a choice you choose, and it's not easy. And you'll keep getting pulled back to that path every other day. But you just know you want to walk down that way and it's going to take you to the most beautiful place rather than the darkest hole that, that one leads to. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I don't know if that was the question intended to go, but it's certainly a, a realisation that um, whatever, if you're causing pain to yourself um, in whatever way, that is a, that's a, that's a decision-making moment, I think, where you have to change. Yeah, and I think as well that you have to be aware enough of your own brain to be able to step back and be like, Oh, hang on a minute, I just spent the last five minutes being really mean about myself. Like, mm-hmm. Rather than being so in your head and so identified with thought that you can't see. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah. If you are in that and you're like, no, I really am the fucking worst person ever, you're never going to be able to see above that. You almost yeah. need to be learn mindfulness so you can watch your thoughts and be like, oh, God, I was horrible to myself then. I'm going to make sure that now, as soon as I've noticed that I'm being that way, that mm-hmm. I step back. But it's hard. I mean, that's what, that's why they're called patterns. They're so ingrained in us. Yeah, yeah. You know, even the physical stuff, like you drinking too much coffee or whatever yeah. it is, they're so ingrained in our everyday to life that, that to change them is notoriously difficult. Yeah. It's not something that is going to happen overnight or in a week or even a month. Um, I think we're in a part of our life as well now where when we were at school and college and that kind of stuff, we're, we're learning and we're being told that that's how we have to live is to absorb and to change and to grow and to, and now we're in our, I mean, you're late twenties, I'm 30 now is it's, it's almost impossible. You feel like you've already chosen the character in the game, you know, yeah. I mean, it's like all the attributes are there. You can't change that now. Um, so it's really hard. It is really hard. And I've, but so satisfying when you do, when yeah. you can look back and be like, that was so unhealthy for me and I have completely flipped on its head and I yeah. don't, do that anymore or I don't do those things yeah. um it's the same with drugs I really look forward to that not being a part of my life anymore and I say look forward to is because I know I know that I still have everything in me that wants to go and do some drugs on a weekend or whatever yeah. um and so maybe you know at this point in my life maybe I don't want to get rid of it enough to do anything about it but I also know how just meh it is and how non- life-giving it is to yeah. my life um so lots of things like that that you and that's what being a human is i think it's just growing enough to be able to look back and be like okay i need to do this differently i really want to be a better person there blah 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 so that at the end of your life you can be like shit when i was 18 i was an absolute cunt and now <laughs> now i'm essentially buddha you just yeah. you just as long as you're growing you cannot go wrong yeah i think that's it and as long as ever, you're sort of caring for people around you and, and thinking 
positively and inflicting that in some way i think it's yeah it's all you can do really in the time mm-hmm. you've got <laughs> go team yeah high five <laughs> across the table well thank you for listening i hope you enjoyed me rambling on today i feel like i just said loads of shit but i hope you enjoyed dan you dan you it was kind of a daniel but i'd never call you daniel no. dan thanks for asking me the questions thank you for agreeing to do it you're welcome and um you are welcome back anytime you're fun to talk to <laughs> all right bye so there you have it <laughs> there is me in all my glory uh i'm kind of now when i think back to that podcast i'm like did i sound too airy fairy and spiritual and weird i don't know maybe i did but i'm glad that you guys got to hear a bit more about me um don't forget to subscribe if you like this podcast and share it far and wide it helps me so much and i'd be forever grateful And I hope you have an amazing couple of weeks. Thanks so, so much for listening. I love you all. And don't forget that if you're going through something really gross right now, it's all temporary. Everything is temporary and it's going to be okay. I promise you that. Have a good couple of weeks. Bye.